So now it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Ajay Gol. Dr. Gol is one of those unusual individuals who is not only a brilliant scientist, but is an excellent communicator. He is the Director of Epigenetics and Cancer Prevention and Gastrointestinal Cancer Research at Baylor Research Institute in Dallas. He has more than 20 years of experience in cancer research and is the lead author or contributor to more than 200 scientific articles published in prestigious research journals. His current focus is on gastrointestinal cancers using integrative approaches. He has done a great deal of research on curcumin, and he is one of the world's experts on curcumin and cancer. And it is so with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Goel. Our next presenter will be myself, Cheryl Myers. I am an integrative practitioner with degrees in nursing and psychology, and I've worked more than 10 years in outpatient and inpatient psychiatry. I have had the good fortune to have been interviewed by a great number of periodicals to talk about the best ways to integrate mainstream and integrative medicine for a wide variety of issues, especially psychiatric concerns. And our third speaker is Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum. Dr. Teitelbaum is a board-certified internist, and he's also the medical director of the Practitioners Alliance Network. His study on chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia is the first and thus far only study showing effective interventions that results in such a level of improvement that the majority of participants no longer qualified as having chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. His books are amazing. From Fatigue to Fantastic is the best-selling book of all time in the category of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. Pain-Free 123, his newest book, is The Fatigue and Fibromyalgia Solution. He's been featured in many publications, radio, television show, Dr. Oz, Oprah and Friends, Good Morning America. Dr. Teitelbaum is not only an excellent practitioner, but an excellent educator on topics of integrative medicine. And so I would like to start today by talking with uh, a little bit about how turmeric and curcumin uh, are different. Because sometimes we find that individuals are quite confused about the difference between the spice turmeric and the plant turmeric and the natural medicine curcumin. Turmeric is a green leafy plant and it has a little rhizome that grows beneath the ground. When you dig that rhizome up, wash it, dry it, and grind it, you end up with turmeric, the spice. Turmeric is used in a lot of Southeast Asian cooking and curries, and it's a very healthy spice indeed. It's also a natural coloring agent. However, curcumin is the natural medicine that we're going to be talking about today, and there's only 2% to 5% curcumin in turmeric. So as a food, turmeric is excellent. But as a natural medicine, it has an incredibly weak curcumin content, and it is virtually impossible to achieve therapeutic levels for existing medical conditions using turmeric alone. Unfortunately, many individuals in the media confuse turmeric and curcumin, and so some individuals believe that they are interchangeable when nothing could be further from the truth. Curcumin is known as the most potent natural anti-inflammatory in the herbal world, but it does so many more things in addition to helping to reduce levels of chronic inflammation in the body and a variety of inflammatory processes. It is also a super potent antioxidant with the ability to arrest a wide variety of what we call reactive oxygen species or compounds that cause oxidative stress in the body. It is involved in cell signaling. So, for example, in cancer, uh, which we'll be talking about in just a moment, the ability of cancer cells to communicate with one another is one of the ways in which cancer metastasis occurs, and investigations into curcumin have found that it can actually interrupt some of that cell signaling. Curcumin is incredibly potent for detoxification. It is one of the most liver-healthy herbs on the planet involved in liver regeneration and also in enhancing the activity of hepatocytes, those cells within the liver that play such a crucial role in detoxification. It's the most powerful compound thus far investigated for a process called neurogenesis, which is the regrowth of new brain cells. New brain cells are something we're going to be talking about when we discuss depression, but neurogenesis has far-reaching capabilities, and in the future we will look more at curcumin's impact on survivors of stroke or individuals who have had head trauma. 
And last but certainly not least, and this is not an all-inclusive list, curcumin is involved in gene activation. There are genes in the body whose expression slows with age or in the presence of certain diseases or environmental toxins. And curcumin has the ability to actually wake up these sleeping genes and restore them to more youthful levels of activity. Unfortunately, curcumin is poorly absorbed, and in the early studies of curcumin, we saw researchers using 10 to 12 grams of curcumin in their studies in an attempt to reach a therapeutic level in the bloodstream. That's 20 to 24 capsules of curcumin a day, which is very difficult to maintain outside of a clinical study. So newer research has focused on how can one safely increase curcumin's absorption. And that's why the topic of today's lectures are going to be BCM95 curcumin, which is a high absorption curcumin absorbed up to 10 times that of plain curcumin, which uses turmeric essential oils in a patented process to boost absorption. In one of the human bioavailability trials done on BCM95 curcumin, we find that it gets to uh, high levels within about 15 minutes of ingestion, and that the peak that we find with plain curcumin occurs two hours after ingestion and by hour four uh, below 50 nanograms per gram in the bloodstream. BCM95 curcumin gets extremely high levels in the bloodstream and stays at high levels well above 100 nanograms per gram. Uh, even at eight hours, it was not below the 100 mark. This is a crucial breakthrough because not only is more curcumin absorbed, so fewer capsules have to be taken, but it stays at active levels in the bloodstream for more than eight hours, which means instead of dosing every one to two hours to maintain a peak, BCM95 curcumin can be used in human studies given twice daily or sometimes three times daily. So uh, now that we have completed that introduction to BCM95 curcumin, I would like to turn this over to Dr. Ajay Goel. Welcome, Dr. Goel. Hello. Hi, Cheryl. Thanks Thanks for having me on this. Uh, I'm very excited. And uh, in the next few minutes, I'll talk a uh, uh, little bit of, about some of the work we have done over the years uh, on looking at the anti-cancer effects of uh, curcumin. So... So just to give a very brief overview, so when we talk about cancer, um, my interest mostly lies in gastrointestinal cancers. Uh, I work I work mostly on colon cancer, some degree on uh, liver cancer and uh, stomach cancers, but I do I have worked over the years on uh, other cancers too. And when it comes to curcumin, um, I can tell you that there is so much evidence out there. Uh, that curcumin is such a potent anti-cancer agent, uh, whether we're talking about gastrointestinal cancer, liver, lung, blood, you name it. And this evidence does not come from cell culture studies only, because that's another thing I keep hearing from people, that probably most of this evidence is from uh, cell culture or animal studies, and that is absolutely not true. As of today or as of last week, there are close to 60 human studies done on a variety of cancers, with curcumin, and I can tell you that each one of these studies have shown positive cancer preventative effects of curcumin as well as cancer treatment effects of curcumin uh, to different degrees. So suffice it to say that curcumin is a very, very potent cancer preventative and cancer treatment option for patients suffering from a variety of cancers. Next, now when we talk about cancer, I think uh, even now people believe that cancer runs in the families or it is predominantly a hereditary disease, which is absolutely not true. There is only a very small proportion of cancers which are driven genetically or in a hereditary manner uh, where, where cancer is passed on from one generation to the next. So if you look at this image uh, in the panel A, it clearly shows that more than 90 or 95, up to 95 percent of cancers are driven by environmental or dietary factors. So what that means is these cancers have genetics have very little to do with it, and it's mostly how the, the sort of environments we live in or the diets we consume. So 
and, and this is not true just for one particular type of cancer. Uh, the panel B here on the left, bottom left, shows that virtually all types of human cancers um, are driven by environmental and dietary factors. And within that, um, diets are probably one of the most important things. So as humans, we really do not have too much control on our genetics. We are born with a certain set of genes which we inherit from our parents, and there's not too much we can do about it, but this figure clearly illustrates that we do not need to worry about genetics because the genes play a very, very small role, but it, but environments and diets play a much bigger role, and unlike genetics, we do not, for which we do not have any control on, we have a lot of control on the environments we live in or the diets we consume. Every piece of food we put in our mouth, we have a lot of control. So essentially, this figure highlights, this image highlights that it is not all about genes. It is not all about the destiny. It is all about the lifestyle we choose to live. Um, so that's why I say that significant uh, cancer prevention through dietary lifestyle factors is absolutely possible, and we can do a lot on how we choose to live our lives, and we can prevent a lot of these cancers. Uh, my work in recent years have uh, focused on a specific uh, uh, molecular alteration. We call it epigenetic changes. So this is a somewhat recent concept which has come to attention in the last decade or so. Uh, the word epigenetic is essentially the compound word, which means epi and genetic. So it's a so the process of uh, epigenetics is it's a process which basically extracts information from our DNA. So, so we are born with a certain set of DNA, but that DNA on its own doesn't do us any good. So there has to be a process which extracts information from the DNA, tells our genes how they're going to behave. So, so, the, the, so this process which dictates whether the genes are going to behave in the manner they're supposed to, or they will they are going to behave in a manner which they are not supposed to. So in terms of cancer, we have two sets of genes. One set of genes we call oncogenes or tumor promoting genes. So in a healthy individual, these oncogenes should be should not be expressed or if they are, they should be very low level ex expression. What that means is that they're not overactive and will not allow cancer to form. But on the other hand, there's another set of genes, we call them tumor suppressor genes. They function like brakes on the car. So their job is to slow down the progression of cancers, and we would like for these genes to be active all the time. So when we look at epigenetic changes, and this concept uh, is relatively new, and there are three major types of epigenetic changes. One is changes in DNA methylation, second is histone modifications, and third is microRNAs. So among these, DNA methylation is most, lab, most widely studied, and our group has contributed quite a bit on that. So this is a process that tumor suppressor genes, which I said they should be active all the time, they tend to get methylated. They can acquire methylation uh, in cancer cells, and if that happens, if the gene becomes methylated, which is supposed to function as a break, it goes into a sleep mode, which is not desirable. We do not want tumor suppressor genes to go into a sleep or, or become inactive. So, so we have learned that in cancers, most of these genes go into a sleep mode because of DNA methylation, and as a result, the tumor or the cancer continues to grow, So, which is not a good thing. So what I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes is now we have learned that a lot of dietary polyphenols, and curcumin being one of those, is a very potent anti-methylating agent. So if you if you take patients who have cancer and you give them curcumin, we know that it works for them, but now we have learned is that one of the processes how curcumin shows its anti-cancer effect is through reversing DNA methylation. So genetic changes are totally irreversible. You're born with certain set of information you can't change. However, epigenetic changes are reversible, which makes them very, very attractive that you can reverse these changes and you can shrink these tumors or you can make these tumors go away. So next I'm going to share some of the studies, uh, human studies uh, uh, we have done on this specific form of curcumin. Uh, uh, Cheryl mentioned before BCM95 curcumin. So I love BCM95 curcumin. I've done quite a bit of studies on this, particularly because of the reason it is better absorbed, it is all natural, and it stays in the body longer. So you have to be mindful that when you use uh, curcumin preparation that you have to use curcumin, which which is which absorbs better because of its poor 
absorbance otherwise. So in this particular study, it was a study done on humans. It's a 40 patients uh, who had prostate cancer, and these patients uh, were, the, the purpose of the study was to, to look at the effect of curcumin in radio, in, in radio sensitizing or, or see the radioprotective effects of BCM95 curcumin in patients who have um, prostate cancers. So 40 patients were enrolled in the study, and these patients underwent um, external beam radiotherapy, or e EBRT, and so it was a two, uh, it was actually a three uh, group study. Group one was a placebo, group two received three grams of BCM-95 curcumin, two capsules, 500 milligrams twice a day, and the third group received turmeric oils. So what we found in this study was that BCM-95 curcumin was extremely helpful in, in, in protecting these patients from the adverse effects of radiation therapy. So, so the, the challenge is with the radiation therapy is that it is very good at killing tumor cells, but at the same time, radiation can also kill your normal cells which are surrounding the tumor, so, which is not a good thing. So you, you want to have a treatment which primarily focuses on killing the tumor cells. And what we showed in this particular study was that patients who received curcumin along with radiation actually did, did much better because curcumin was able to protect them from the adverse effects of radiation therapy. And in terms of, their, in terms of um, uh, visible symptoms, one of the greatest challenges, uh, great, biggest problem with patients who undergo radiation therapy with prostate cancer is they have difficulty urinating and many other symptoms. So what we saw in this particular study was there was a 50% reduction in number of men uh, with daytime urinary frequency when they took curcumin, which is huge. And also, there were an additional 30% men experienced reduction in um, symptoms with sleep dis disturbances, which are related to urinary issues again. So this is very important because these patients go through such a toxic treatment, and if they just took one gram of curcumin every day, then we can, then we can use... Uh, then we can then these patients significantly benefited from taking curcumin and felt much much better this is another clinical study which was done on patients with uh, oral submucosis fibrosis so oral submucosis fibrosis essentially is a is a precursor or a step before uh, these patients develop uh, uh, cancer in their oral cavity, so it's a precancerous condition uh, in the mouth, and roughly 8% of these patients progress to cancer. So, so the point is, if we can proactively treat these patients with curcumin, we can hopefully prevent these patients from progressing further and, and avoid having cancer. So this was a randomized trial. It was a six-month study with 16 patients in each arm, and just like the previous study, uh, patients took 500 milligrams of BCM-95 curcumin twice daily, and the other group received placebo. So in this particular study, again, like I showed in the previous uh, study in prostate cancer, patients who took BCM-95 curcumin experienced significant reduction in symptoms uh, of uh, increased fibrosis just after 15 days. So this is a very, very short duration. Just in 15 days, they were able to draw the benefits of using curcumin uh, uh, in, in this particular study. And not only the symptoms, uh, symptomatic relief, but on a molecular level or on a histological level, the histology of these, uh, uh, the oral cavity in these patients was much better. So what that tells to a pathologist that these cells were not progressing towards cancer. And at the end of six month trial, seven participants in the placebo group had progressed to advanced disease which was closer to developing a malignant cancer, and only one individual out of 16. So one in 16 versus seven in 16. That's a, huge, that's a significant difference. Only one out of 16 patients in the BCM group uh, progressed further, while seven out of 16 progressed uh, towards cancer in the, in the, in the, place, in the placebo group. So, so these examples clearly show that BCM95 curcumin is so potent in terms of preventing and slowing down the progression of disease. This last study um, I'm going to share with you is, uh, is a study which came from our group uh, where we were not only interested in looking at curcumin um, as, a, as a cancer preventative, but here we, we, we took a group of, uh, we used the model, this is, a, this is an in vitro study, but we used a model that patients who already are taking chemotherapy for their cancer treatment, 
they typically suffer from the side effects or toxicity of chemotherapy. So that's one of the concerns because these patients are experiencing side effects from chemotherapy. But the second challenge is the chemotherapies given to patients, typically they, leave, they are active against tumor cells, but they do not act against the stem cells or the cancer stem cells. So the cancer stem cells are the, are the cells which typically do not respond to the traditional chemotherapies we have. And what happens as a result is that these cells are left behind. The patient takes the chemotherapy. They have a phenomenal response in the first few months. And a few months later, that tumor comes back. And that, comes, that tumor relapses essentially because these cancer stem cells are left behind. And, and in just a matter of a few months, they continue to grow and proliferate. And a few months later, most patients would experience tumor relapse. And, and by that time, these tumor cells are so clever that they have devised ways to be, that they become non-responsive to the chemotherapy. So the choice to the oncologist is then they'll put the patient on a new chemotherapy and this process goes on until the patient is, either gives up or the patient dies. So in this particular study, we wanted to show that curcumin, when given to patients together with their chemotherapy, actually makes their chemotherapy look better. So what curcumin does is it protects your normal cells from uh, from the toxicity of chemotherapy, but at the same time, it continues to kill cancer stem cells, which tend to regrow again. So it is not only targeting the tumor cells only, but also it is targeting cancer stem cells, which would avoid tumor relapse. So these patients would probably not either experience tumor relapse, or maybe we can push off or delay reappearance of tumor. And lastly, not only it kills the tumors, it, it also helps patients become sensitized to chemotherapy. What that means is that the patients would draw much longer benefit from the chemotherapies they're already taking. So all of these things are very exciting because what that means is that curcumin on its own does wonders, but when given in combination with chemotherapy, actually it can enhance the effects of chemotherapy and have these patients respond better and not experience either tumor relapse or they can push it off for, for longer. So just to summarize, uh, the, the, the drugs we have right now to treat cancer cells, uh, so some of the drugs are listed on the slide. Uh, these drugs uh, shown in these green boxes like Celecoxib or Arbutex or Herceptin, Gleevec, so forth. So these drugs are targeted. These are synthesized keeping a can cancer gene or a cancer pathway in mind. For example, Celecoxib target COX-2 and Avastin ta targets VEGF. Uh, so, so these drugs have ability only to hit one target. So that's why we call them monotargeted therapy. And when you when you look forward, curcumin actually has the ability to hit all of these targets, which is very very fascinating to me because what that shows us that that cancer is such a complex disease, it is never ever driven by COX-2 or EGFR or TNF alone. And that is why, that is part of the reason that most of the patients who are given one of these therapies, they do not respond well because cancer is not a disease of one gene or one pathway. There's so many pathways which are messed up in cancer patients. And if you're going to give them a drug which only acts in only one gene or one pathway, most of the patients are not going to respond because we are not hitting other pathways, but curcumin can. And that is part of the reason all these human trials with curcumin show positive data because curcumin does not only hit just one target, but so many other targets too. So in this particular slide, we are sh what I'm showing is that instead of these super expensive chemotherapies, which can be hundreds of thousands of dollars, and still we're not gonna see all the effect, we can use a much inexpensive, much safer, treatment uh, choice in curcumin because it can hit all of these targets. And lastly, not only these targets, but we have so many other targets which are involved in cancer, uh, curcumin can target. So, so basically this, this slide brings on the message that in contrast to commercially available drugs, which are ex extremely expensive, extremely toxic, do not give us benefit, curcumin offers a safe, inexpensive, and multi-targeted treatment for most human cancers. And with this, I'll stop and I'll let you take over again. Thank you so much, Dr. Gohl. I really appreciate you taking time out of your work at Baylor to talk to us today about curcumin and cancer. Uh, I'm going to spend just a few moments talking about some of the studies on curcumin and major depressive disorder. 
Um, BCM95 curcumin and depression has two studies thus far looking specifically at major depression disorder. Curcumin has been shown to exhibit significant activity. Uh, it's been found to enhance the activity of MAO and SSRI antidepressant medications, and so it has not been found to negatively interact with some of the current prescription drugs that are used for depression. And it does help to restore levels of serotonin and dopamine depleted due to chronic stress. Therefore, it has some mild impact on neurotransmitters in the brain. However, uh, it does other things as well. As Dr. Gold pointed out that curcumin is multifaceted in its ability to touch each and every one of those different pathways that targets cancer, uh, curcumin also t touches many pathways that lead to depression. Depression is not a simple disease. And if depression were merely a serotonin deficiency, we would have cured it by now. Uh, curcumin helps because we find that individuals with depressive disorders have higher levels of inflammation in the brain. So the fact that it is a potent anti-inflammatory and that BCM95 crosses the blood-brain barrier makes it particularly useful with that application. It also helps to inhibit certain enzymes that degrade neurotransmitters. And by relieving the inflammation and balancing the enzymes that break up neurotransmitters, we do see a better balance of neurotransmitters in the brain. But I want to point out this last bullet point because this is fascinating. It promotes neurogenesis, which is the recreation of new brain cells. And what they have found, going back for just a moment, what they have found with neurogenesis is that individuals with major depressive disorder have very low levels of neurogenesis going on in the brain. There's more research that needs to be done to tease out exactly why these two mechanisms are connected. But it has been shown in a very sad study of individuals who committed suicide. They looked at their brains and found extremely low levels of neurogenesis. Compared to individuals who were age and gender matched, for um, who had died of other causes, car accidents or boating accidents, and they found that they had normal to high levels of neurogenesis. So even though this complex connection has not fully been elucidated, they have found that higher levels of neurogenesis in the brain is associated with improvements in depression. So when we look at the studies on depression, we find in the first study, there were 60 patients with major depressive disorder. Group 1 received fluoxetine, and one major brand of fluoxetine is Prozac, one of the best-selling antidepressant drugs of all time. And the second group, BCM95 curcumin, 500 milligrams twice daily was taken. And in the third group, there was a combination of both the drug intervention and the nutrient intervention. The study lasted six weeks, and the patients were evaluated using the clinically validated Hamilton Depression Rating Scale. The results were very interesting. The response rate was about the same in all groups. So what we found was that the BCM95 curcumin worked just as well as the fluoxetine, one brand name of which is Prozac, uh, in alleviating major depressive disorder. The group where both were taken together had a little bit better results. However, it was not, it did not reach the level of significance. So what we determined from the study was that curcumin was equally effective to fluoxetine, but without the adverse effects. And another determination of the study is that the two can be combined and it does not cause any negative interactions with fluoxetine, um, which is in the category of serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. In the second study, this was a placebo-controlled double-blinded trial, 56 patients had major depressive disorder. One group received BCM95 curcumin, 500 milligrams twice daily, versus placebo. The study lasted eight weeks. The patients were evaluated primarily with the inventory of depression symptomology self-rated version. BCM95 curcumin's impact on depression became significant versus placebo at week four. So at week four, they started to see some um, measurable improvements in alleviating major depressive disorder in the curcumin group. These results continued to improve through week eight. 
uh, BCM95 curcumin had an even greater efficacy in a subgroup of individuals with atypical depression. Atypical depression uh, is difficult to treat, and very often people with atypical depression do not respond very well to pharmaceutical interventions. So the researchers stated that BCM95 curcumin was shown to have antidepressant effects in people with major depressive disorder. So because of the enhanced absorption and the presence of the turmeric essential oil, the turmeric essential oil has important compounds as well that are very beneficial for health. BCM95 curcumin is unique. Uh, given the troublesome adverse effects and subsequent lack of compliance with certain types of antidepressant medication, it makes sense for doctors to incorporate BCM95 curcumin into their wellness plans for individuals with depression. Antidepressant medication can cause weight gain, dry mouth, dry eye, constipation, insomnia, hypersomnia, sexual dysfunction, inability to have orgasm, sleepwalking, other troubling sleep behaviors, the list goes on and on. So if we can achieve a level of alleviation of major depressive disorder using BCM95 curcumin, imagine how much human suffering can be prevented by being able to do so without these troubling adverse effects. And so I'd like to turn this over now to our last speaker, Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum, who's going to share with us information on rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, and pain. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, it's funny, when you listen to all that side effects, you've been trained wrong. If you had done it like they do on TV, everybody would be wanting all those side effects plus rectal leakage. But anyway, it's, it's funny how uh, medicine has people so convinced about the benefits of medications where what we seem to get is the highest price, the lowest benefit, and the highest toxicity uh, based on how our medical system is set up. The good news is that by using alternatives such as curcumin, uh, we start to move towards, as Dr. Gold said, getting the lowest price, highest benefit, highest safety uh, that you'll see. So let's take a look uh, at the effect of curcumin in people with rheumatoid and osteoarthritis and pain. I want to start by helping you to, to understand that pain is not the enemy. Uh, I know if you have pain, it's hard to realize that. You want the pain to go away. But pain is actually like your body's warning system. It's like the oil light on your body's dashboard telling you that something needs attention. So there's a couple ways to handle that. You can do what most medications do, uh, most doctors do, um, and basically put a Band-Aid over the pain or over the oil light and say, is that better now? And then we wonder, uh, we say, yeah, I guess that thread blasting light's not so bad, and we wonder why later on in the day our motor burns out. Well, same with medications in terms of toxicity. If you look at standard prescription medications for arthritis, uh, looking at Motrin and Celebrex type medications, for example, like uh, what are called NSAIDs. Uh, these medications kill about 30,000 Americans every year needlessly. You'd think that would be on the news. kind of shocks me, but, um, but this is data. It's just very clear data. Um, what you see are 16,500 deaths a year from bleeding ulcers, uh, a 40 to 300 plus percent increased risk of heart attack and stroke death. Um, these medications are very, very toxic. Uh, then you have Tylenol, much safer, but still uh, fairly toxic compared to the herbs, which is the number one cause of uh, drug overdose and liver failure in the United States from acute overdose. Um, we'll see that the medications used for depression, uh, as Cheryl noted, rife with side effects and really not that effective. Um, and these other medications are being used for pain as well. And then narcotics, 15,000 deaths each year from prescribed narcotics in the United States from overdose. So what doctors are taught about treating pain, give Motrin family medications or Tylenol. Uh, there's a new family of the anti-epileptic and SSRI, SNRIs, or give them narcotics if they have cancer. Or if you're a surgeon, operate. That is basically almost the totality of doctors' education in pain management. And it's really sad. It's why one in four Americans suffer unnecessarily with chronic pain. It's not that there's no effective treatment. 
is that physicians simply are not taught about effective treatments and believe that if they don't know something, it does not exist. So let's take a look at what the science shows and what can be done. So let's take a look, for example, with rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. Let's take a look at a couple of the studies here. Um, looking at, uh, let's begin with rheumatoid arthritis, where people have big, red, hot, swollen joints. Uh, we have a nice study with 45 people with rheumatoid arthritis who are given the high absorption PCM95 curcumin. And again, uh, let me say one thing. I've, I've been doing holistic medicine for about 35 years now. I've gone through tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of studies um, and looking at natural healing and things related. And for about 30 years, it frustrated me no end. You saw almost a thousand studies showing that curcumin was potentially one of the most effective herbs in the world for treating cancer, pain, inflammation, and a host of other conditions, yet you could not get enough into the person to make it reasonable to use in clinical practice. They have to take 14 to 20 pills a day, and that just was not sustainable. Uh, so when the research came out showing that the BCM95 was seven to 10 times as absorbed, that means one pill instead of 10 pills, um, or you know, for most cases, it's two pills instead of 20, like in the rheumatoid arthritis case, this opened up a whole world um, and the healthcare field choosing natural therapies. So looking at rheumatoid arthritis, they gave 500 milligrams twice a day of the high absorption BCM95 uh, versus Voltaren, which is uh, probably one of the better NSAID um, medications, uh, arthritis medications out there. Um, and then they combined the two of them. And they were hoping to get a significant reduction of disease activity score, or DS, DAS28, which is kind of a big picture uh, score that we use to see how people are doing. And what we found um, was a really sharp effect with the curcumin. You'll see that the activity of the disease dropped by almost half in the, uh, in the study group. Um, and the people who are taking just the Voltaren, it didn't it dropped, but not quite that much. Um, so we're seeing that it had very similar effectiveness. And most of the effectiveness that you got from the curcumin uh, plus the Voltaren together, you can get just by taking the curcumin by itself. So the result was that the BCM95 uh, curcumin worked as well as the prescription medication. Um, it's interesting. We saw, let's see, 14% of the people had to stop the Voltaren because of side effects. And with medications, there's a lot of side effects. You have the list that Cheryl gave for antidepressants, um, for the rheumatoid arthritis drugs. Again, that can be very helpful, but a lot of toxicities uh, with Motrin family medications, as you mentioned, 30,000 plus deaths a year where when you use the herbals, instead of the side effects, you get side benefits. Nobody withdrew from the curcumin group. There are none. Nobody had problems that caused them to drop out of the study. Instead of the side effects that you see with medications, what you get with the herbals is side or side benefits. So with the curcumin, you have less pain, less inflammation, less cancer, less depression, better mood. Um, and interestingly enough, one thing that hadn't been talked about, um, not just does it help the brain with depression, but it also seems very powerfully involved in helping prevent and treat Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we are currently doing a study now where we are enrolling people who have Alzheimer's or dementia of any sort um, and putting them in a study that includes a holistic treatment approach, including the BCM95 curcumin. Uh, in India, where they have a high curcumin intake, you have 70% less Alzheimer's. So an important thing, it's really nice instead of getting side effects to get side benefits. So we had another study that looked at combining curcumin, the highly absorbed BCM95 curcumin, along with a special boswellia. Boswellia, uh, which is better known as frankincense, has two compounds, one that helps settle inflammation and another one that increases it. Um, 
So what you want to do is you want to use, I like one called Bospeer, that takes the pro-inflammatory component out, uh, takes out the bad stuff, leaves just the good stuff. Uh, so this study combined those two for osteoarthritis and 28 people with osteoarthritis for the knee. And what you found um, in com comparing it against Celebrex, which again is one of the better uh, arthritis medications out there, in a study that lasted 12 weeks, the effect was dramatic. Um, in people who were on the curcumin boswellia, 78% of them rated their pain as moderate to begin with. That dropped to 21% by the end of the study, where with the Celebrex group, only 71% had their pain as moderate. And by 50%, by the end of the study, 50% still had uh, what they considered at least moderate pain. So you had a 21% drop in the Celebrex group and a 57% drop in the curcumin boswellia group. And that is dramatic. Um, in terms of functional ability, um, only 21% of them were able to walk more than about a half a mile uh, at the beginning of the study in the curcumin boswellia group. By the end, 92% of the people were able to walk uh, over that half mile. So you'll see dramatic benefits using two herbs that are not only safe, but beneficial. So the conclusion, um, when you look at these things, we have one out of four adult Americans in chronic pain. We have over 30,000 deaths a year uh, from NSAID medications in the US. This is all preventable simply by giving, using the BCM95 and other herbals that are readily available. But again, I can't overly stress, the curcumin by itself was not helpful. You could not give enough plain curcumin unless you're eating an Indian diet all the time to get the effect. It was so frustrating to me as a physician. But now that by simply adding the essential oils back in, that discovery that you can increase absorption sevenfold or more has opened the door to many, many benefits. So with the BCM95 curcumin being able to be optimally absorbed, we can save 30,000 U.S. deaths a year. And these are deaths from people who are often in their prime. Think about it. 30,000 deaths a year. You'd think this would be priority number one in, the, in our Senate. Well, well, I guess not. But okay. Uh, but, um, you know, this is what it can do. You know, we're not going to wait for the government to do it, but wait for us to do it. It's up to us. Uh, it can reduce narcotic addiction and deaths from overdose. I've seen people who the morphine, because I, I treat chronic pain. Uh, I'll have people see me from all over the world uh, who have not been able to get benefit for their pain. And I have seen uh, people who are on morphine who could not get benefit when they took the BCM95 uh, in combination with some other natural herbs, their pain went away. I just It's remarkable stuff. Uh, it can help millions of people who have cancer and it can allow the 5 million people in the U.S. who have Alzheimer's to slow progression of the disease. It can prevent the Alzheimer's in many and give them good mental functioning for a much longer uh, part of their lives. This makes the BCM95 curcumin an incredibly powerful natural tool. So Cheryl, did you want to go over the dosage and list studies? Um, you know, but why don't we just move it ahead? And uh, yes, absolutely. And we'll unmute the phones if you could, please, Jennifer, of Dr. Goal as well. Uh, so in case there's any comment, but the general dosage that most practitioners are using is 500 milligrams of curcuminoids uh, delivered in 750 milligrams once or twice daily. Uh, sometimes there are some increases, as Dr. Goal pointed out, in the uh, radiation therapy study. It was six capsules per day instead of two. So somewhere is usually two to three. Uh, if We also want to point out, and I always like to say this, that please, because of this theoretical use or because of the studies that have been done thus far, 
please make sure that if you decide that BCM95 curcumin is something you want to add to your own health plan, if you have a serious disease or are undergoing chemotherapy, please talk with your health care practitioner in order to uh, blend that in with what you're currently using. Uh, not all chemotherapy uses have been fully examined. Uh, the majority of them appear to only benefit from curcumin use, but there are two types of chemotherapy, the cyclophosphamides and adriamycin, uh, that, sh that there is some theoretical concern since they share a pathway that they might diminish their effectiveness. Um, this is the list of studies done specifically on BCM95. Curcumin red denotes a human study on, as we have mentioned today, uh, cancer, depression, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. There are also some veterinary studies in cats, dogs, and racehorses. So I thank all of our attendees for spending time with me today, and I see that we are already accumulating um, answers and questions in our chat box and in our QA box. So if you both are ready, I'm going to start um, and read some of this information. All right. One of the questions has to do with um, multiple myeloma. And this person is using uh, two 750-milligram pills three times a day. Um, for multiple myeloma, do we think this is a good dose? Anybody so want can, to weigh in on that? Yes, go ahead, yeah, Dr. Gall. I, yeah, I'll, I'll say that. Um, I, I think that's a good dose, um, um, just like, uh, Cheryl, you mentioned earlier. So anybody who's taking or who is considering taking curcumin for, for any treatment, whether it's cancer or Alzheimer's or depression, uh, just like uh, Cheryl mentioned, I think you – patient should first consider discussing this their own particular case with their physician uh, who is treating them. So that's absolutely important. Now, is 750 milligram twice a day enough for multiple myeloma? Um, probably it's a, it's, a, it's a decent dose. Um, there are multiple trials done on curcumin with multiple myeloma. And I think uh, 750, because curcumin is so safe, I do not see any uh, concerns with regard to toxicity. And in terms of benefit one can draw, I think 750 milligrams twice a day is decent. But if if the, even going three pills a day probably would be safe enough too. So again, yeah. every patient responds with a different rate, different situation. So, but 750 milligrams twice or three times a day should be a decent dose. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, here's a question that has to do with gene activation. And they're wondering if um, if you have gene mutations, if somehow curcumin activates gene mutations. I would think it would do just the opposite. Wouldn't it prevent yeah. gene mutations? Absolutely. And and we have published a study uh, before that curcumin actually helps prevent gene mutations because the mutations in our genes happen because of uh, uh, alterations in the enzymes, which basically replicates DNA, which is a DNA polymerase. So this is an enzyme which continues to copy our DNA over and over as the cells form. And we have shown previously that actually curcumin can help reduce the mutation rate because that's how it works as a as a anti-inflammatory or as an anti-cancer agent. Actually, it does not promote mutation uh, happening, but it prevents for mutations to occur. All right. Uh, here's a question asking if there's ever been any studies on Parkinson's disease and curcumin. Are either of you aware of studies on? I believe there have been. Absolutely. Uh, there are uh, at least three human trials I can think of. Uh, they're not large trials, but, but uh, there are two or three studies done on Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And it would work perhaps by helping to preserve uh, brain function. Most Many people think of Parkinson's as a systemic disease, but it's actually a brain disease in which the area of the brain that controls voluntary movement uh, becomes damaged. And so I think that the studies have shown that by reducing uh, the inflammation in that area and also helping to prevent the oxidative stress that leads to premature cell death, it helps to forestall the progression of the disease. I think that's what I've read in most of the studies. Um, speaking of neurogenesis, uh, a brain-related topic, uh, any evidence that curcumin might help with neurogenesis in patients with brain injuries? Uh, I am 
only aware of the work done on neurogenesis with regards to depression. It makes perfect sense to me that in individuals who have had past brain injuries, that using curcumin could only be of benefit. Are either of you aware of any neuro, newer trials of people with brain injury using curcumin to stimulate neurogenesis? Cheryl, uh, my, I think the, the process of neurogenesis, typically uh, most of these studies uh, are done in animals because it's not possible to really, or it's not easy, I would say, to, to monitor neurogenesis in, uh, in humans because the techniques we have, they will not clearly reflect formation of new brain cells in humans, but there, there's tons of evidence in, in, in a variety of animal studies that it does promote neurogenesis in, in these conditions. That's all I know, and but... And so, if and so, if they're dealing with a nine-year-old child who had previous brain injury five years before, part of the process of recovering has to do with the creation of new neural pathways to compensate for the area of loss. So, um, while we cannot say there's 15 human studies proving its effectiveness, I certainly think it would be an intelligent choice to try. And, and so, let me add one other thing too: with traumatic brain injury, um, what we find in numerous studies with that is that you'll see loss of hormonal function. You get uh, damage to the hypothalamic pituitary axis that makes most of the hormones. It's not severe enough damage to show up in the testing, but it's severe enough to cause really marked uh, dysfunction, cognitive problems. Um, and the study after study, the researchers are, are kind of, you can hear them almost crying, why are the doctors ignoring this? So for that person who has a child with a TBI, um, make sure that the child's hormones are optimized. You probably need to see a holistic physician to do that. But if there are symptoms of low thyroid, low adrenal, other hormones, those need to be addressed as well in combinations for the TBI to get better. Here's a question uh, from a person whose husband has advanced oral cancer, um, which is inoperable, and he is using a feeding tube for nourishment. Is there a liquid form of BCM95 or a tablet which can be crushed? Um, it is possible to use BCM95 curcumin via a feeding tube. Um, it, it can be a little bit more challenging because uh, some of the delivery systems that I'm aware of are in soft gels where there's a, something of an oil inside of a soft gel. Um, since it's a fat-soluble compound, you would have to mix it in with a fatty substance. Like if you were on a tube feeding, for example, some of the kinds I'm aware of are things like, uh, you know, Ensure, Jevity, et cetera. They have a certain amount of fat content, so it would be perfectly all right to mix in the BCM95 curcumin into the tube feeding to administer, but it would not mix well with water. So if you are, because it is a fat-soluble compound, so if you're trying to, uh, for example, mix it with water for the feeding tube, it's not going to work as well. Um, let's see. We have so many questions coming in. Um, in, to, you, in talking about Bosleyan curcumin with uh, the different types of arthritis, does it just relieve the inflammation and the pain, or does it actually help to improve the joint, like the cartilage, et cetera? It can help with the healing. But the thing is to see, if you look at the studies that look at improvement in joint cartilage, um, it takes so many people in a study like that to reach statistically significant uh, levels of improvement that even if you see that happening, uh, those are multi-million dollar studies. That's where you need hundreds and thousands of people in the study to be properly powered to see that effect. So I've not seen any studies looking at that specifically. But the impression based on its mechanism of action is that it does help the healing instead of just going ahead and masking the pain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one of the questions has to do with purchasing BCM95 curcumin and Bospure Boswellia. Um, we try to keep these educational web webinars as non-commercial as possible, so we're talking about the science behind these supplements. But um, I think... Um, if you do a little Google search or send us an email afterwards, we'd be glad to chat with you about that. Here's one about um, do you need to take the curcumin and Boswellia separately or can you take it together? Um, absolutely, you can take it together. And I know that there are natural medicines on the market and products that do combine both. And Dr. Teitelbaum, do you have any specific recommendations on dosages for fibromyalgia pain? 
Well, for the common combinations that you're going to find, uh, I'm going to go with higher dosing. We've seen pretty dramatic benefits um, with curcumin, uh, Boswellia combinations, and we all combine DLPA and natokinase. You can find them all in combination. Uh, for the ones we use, uh, we'll use two tablets three times a day for six weeks, um, and then drop the dose from there uh, down to one three times a day. It takes. You need to understand for natural remedies. Um, with, with medications, you're poisoning enzyme systems, um, and you'll see very quick effect, but you also see high toxicity. With natural remedies, you're rebuilding systems. Uh, it's kind of like the difference between building a house versus tearing down a house. So you'll see some effect uh, often within an hour, even using the high absorption curcumin boswellia. Um, but it takes six weeks to see the full effect. And again, I'm going to give higher dosing, two tablets three times a day for the uh, first six weeks, and then I'll drop it down to one three times a day or twice a day as needed. Um, these herbs are compatible with any of the pain medications in common use. Um, the only concern I have in terms of the interaction would be adding Coumadin, uh, which you can't really add anything, herb or otherwise. I'll give it to people on a blood thinner Coumadin, but I will check their bleeding times. So now for fibro pain, we're seeing very dramatic benefits of uh, that and also using uh, topical uh, creams such as Comfrey. Uh, people are getting very nice responses too. So a lot that you could do naturally, very, very effective. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, a quick question on what's the best way to take BCM95 um, after a meal or on an empty stomach. You can use it either way, but many people prefer to take it with a meal because there are factors in the meal that may slightly enhance its absorption even more. And we have an excellent question here that um, I would like both of you to answer if you don't mind. And it says, um, let me go and find it for a moment. Excuse me, I've got so many coming in here, it's hard to get back to. Uh, that People want to know, uh, please explain how curcumin is one of the world's most powerful natural supplements, but most people have never even heard of it, especially from their doctors. Dr. Gold, do you want to go first? Sure, uh, I'll take a step. Yes, so um, there's no doubt about that because... Uh, I can tell you from a research perspective that if you if you look if you look at uh, National Institutes of Health's uh, scientific uh, database, which is PubMed, so you can look at for yourself. This is definitely there's no question about that. This is probably the only naturally occurring herb which has most amount of science behind it. So there are close to more than 6,000 peer-reviewed scientific articles on this herb, and there's nothing which comes close to to this. I mean, you've heard of many other botanicals, you've heard of drugs, you've seen medicines. I can challenge that there's nothing, not even 3,000 articles, not even a few hundred articles in many of these herbs. So no question about that. It is not just um, a well-recognized uh, herb um, just in, in, in anecdotal use or, or traditional use, but there's so much science behind it. So that's one thing. And the second thing is I'm often asked, does it work for this particular condition or that particular condition? And my answer, I don't even think these days at all when somebody asks me that because I know for sure that virtually there's no human disease I can think of for which curcumin has not been studied. So that speaks volumes because if there are so many studies and if virtually no disease has yet not been studied with curcumin really tells you that this is such a potent compound because otherwise there wouldn't be any justification or reason for, for people to try it out. And when I say that, this is all scientific-based. And not only that, the third reason I like curcumin the most and why it is so important is I mentioned that there's 6,000-plus studies, scientific studies published on that, this compound. There are other than a handful of five or seven studies, every single study I know of has shown positive data with curcumin use. Yes, the levels of degree of effects vary from study to study, model to model, disease to disease, but every single study I know of has shown positive benefits of curcumin. So I think having all of this out there, plus the the historical or traditional use of curcumin for centuries in different systems of medicine, I think all put together clearly tells you that this is probably the only, I mean, I don't want to make it look like a medical cure, but it is truly a medical cure for most diseases. And the reason 
why it does so well is it's a very strong anti-inflammatory compound, and inflammation plays a role in virtually every chronic disease. So I'll Excellent. let Dr. That's Teitelbaum, yeah. Yes, yes, Dr. Um, Teitelbaum. And from a, so uh, Dr. Gohl has given from the clinic, from the research, from a clinical point of view as a physician, it was quite a shock to me when I realized that natural remedies would work. I still remember the first time somebody came and asked about coenzyme Q10 for heart failure. And I, I looked him in the eye and said, you're a fool. If this worked, don't you think they would have taught me about it in medical school? But I made a mistake. I said, but let me go do a literature search. And I came back, and there are six studies showing it to be very effective. And I found this in, in natural remedy after natural remedy. I was shocked as a physician to see this. And um, your doctors are very well-meaning. They truly are. But the problem is they don't understand where their information is coming from. Virtually all the information that physicians get uh, really constitutes slick advertising masquerading as science. And that's a paraphrase from a past editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, almost all the information we get is spoon-fed us by the drug company uh, advertising departments. And they're spoon-fed us uh, in conferences that are almost all paid for by the drug companies, uh, where we get information from impressive-sounding professors and speakers who are on the payroll of the drug companies. Um, we have information from journals. And if you look at the ads in the journals, there's no ads for golf clubs, no ads for Lexuses. It's all drug company advertising. Nobody would pay what they're charging for that kind of thing, except that it really does get the drug company access. So the bottom line is the reason your doctor doesn't know about it is that it's not expensive. <laughs> it's too cheap. It's too low cost for anybody to come and spend the $80, billion, $80 million a year per drug that they usually spend advertising it to physicians. So sadly, most doctors don't know the research. What they know is drug company advertising masquerading as research. This is not an expensive drug, or your doctor would know about it. Mm. Um, and, and another question that's along similar lines, why is it not caught on like some of the others, like fish oil, vitamin D, et cetera, where we see it in the media every day? Well, I would have to say that it is catching on because the fastest-growing mm -hmm. herb, according to different industry statistics in the natural medicine world, in both 2012 and 2013, was the turmeric curcumin. Uh, curcumin extracted from turmeric, remember, is the beneficial form that's used as a natural medicine. So I believe that um, it takes a while to accumulate enough to burst into more mainstream awareness, but I do think it's getting there. Uh, we have many questions asking about today's presentation as far as the slides. Um, the slides had been sent to everyone who registered for this presentation. So please do check your spam filter to see if they got caught there. Um, if not, contact us. We'd be glad to send it to you again. And we've also had many questions asking if this is recorded and if they will be able to access this information again. Yes, give us uh, until Monday. And you will probably, uh, um, on Monday, most likely, perhaps Tuesday, receive a link in your emails to the recorded aspect of this presentation. Um, if you would like to listen to it again or if you have friends that you think this would be useful for that you would like them to listen to it. Um, let's see. Uh, we had a lot of questions specific cancers, especially brain tumors um, like schwannoma. Um, it's my understanding that curcumin has been useful uh, for every single cancer for which it's been tested. And in fact, Boswellia has many excellent cancer studies, especially on brain tumors as well. Is that correct, Dr. Gohl? That That is true, Cheryl. That's absolutely true. I do not know personally uh, a particular study about schwannomas, but I can tell you that there are many, many studies done on brain, different types of brain tumors, and I wouldn't be surprised if such a study exists for, for schwannomas too. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Dr. Teitelbaum, does curcumin, taking it in the evening, interfere with normal sleep? We've not seen any problem with that. And, in fact, for most people, uh, a lot of people have their pain interfering with their sleep. So taking it in the evening can help the pain and in that way help sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, another question about does curcumin cause heartburn and a person who has bad acid reflux? I have not heard that BCM95 curcumin because you don't have to take 20 to 24 pills. I have not had that complaint. Have you, Dr. Teitelbaum? 
advanced. We've had a lot of people with fibromyalgia taking it, and we've not had people coming back. And people with fibro are among the most sensitive to side effects of anything. Uh, it's mm-hmm. been very well tolerated. We've not had people coming back having problems with it. Mm-hmm. We had a question about, is curcumin safe with tamoxifen? Um, I personally am not aware of any specific interactions, but again, we always encourage you to talk to your doctor, talk to your pharmacist to find out if um, if BCM95 curcumin is right to combine with whatever treatments or therapeutics you're receiving. Um, let's see. Sorry, we've got so many coming in, I have to keep scrolling to try to keep up with them. Um, uh, here's a person who said that they would love to be a part of any study using natural meds to help themselves and others with RA and osteoarthritis. There's not enough uh, studies done on people with these diseases um, and th- that maybe the doctors would pay better attention if there were more and more human studies on this. I absolutely agree with you uh, that there would be perhaps the more studies we have, the better it is for acceptance in mainstream medicine. All right. Um We also have a question about curcumin in pets. Uh, Yes, BCM95 curcumin has studies in cats, uh, dogs. These are veterinary studies, um, and horses, and specifically racehorses. So, yes, it is safe for use in pets. Um, All right, and so we have a lot of questions about BCM95 curcumin and drugs, and I think it's probably too many to go through at this point in time. Let's just suffice it to say that while we're not aware of a great deal of herb-drug interactions with BCM95 curcumin, we are always cautious with the prescription blood thinner Coumadin, the generic of which is warfarin, and which requires um, ongoing laboratory evaluation to make sure that they are used safely together. Other than that, we're not aware of specific interactions. But again, before you decide, if, you're, if you have a serious illness and you're on a prescription medication that is absolutely necessary for that serious illness, please talk to your individual healthcare practitioner to make sure that this combination is something that's beneficial because even if there are no studies showing this or contraindication, uh, your practitioner may know of some reason why it's particularly useful or perhaps not useful uh, in your specific medical case. All right. Um, let's see what else has come in through here. Uh, safe to use curcumin in children. Dr. Goal, Absolutely. safe for curcumin? Yes, uh, I give it to my two boys. Uh, they're 11 and 9, and I've been giving them. Yes, I think uh, in terms of dose, I would probably give it a little bit smaller dose than what adults would, but it's absolutely safe, and I think we should be considering that, considering, given the diets we consume and um, all of that. I think it's a, it's a very healthy supplement, and we should consider uh, giving it to our kids. There's no concern, and I'm sure Dr. Teitelbaum probably have more to add in terms of clinical use, but uh, so far uh, I've known, I've, I've given to my kids for a long time, and I know that many well, other kids, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as, as you're saying, the you know, if you would feed them curry, if you'd feed them Indian food, yeah, <laughs> then I, it's probably safe. Uh, Doctor Gold, can I ask you a few questions? Uh, I'm, if you don't mind, Cheryl, I just wanted to. Um, if you have somebody with uh, with cancer, I know you want to tailor it to the type, but in general, um, sure. for an adult, what would you say the optimal dosing of the BCM95 curcumin? If you had a family member. Uh, how many milligrams a day? Would you? Uh, is it enough to do it twice a day, or does it need to be three times a day? Yeah, I think that's a very good question, and it, I get asked this often. But again, my first answer is always talk to your physician and all that. So, so we've covered that topic quite a bit. That one must consider talk to the oncologist before you start including curcumin in your diets and your treatment regimens. But, but having said that, a general dose which I suggest, especially for BCM95, and this I'm saying based on my overall impression because I, I talk to a lot of people all day long. I get emails and responses, and people coming back with their own feedback, I feel that a dose of about five to 700 milligrams two or three times a day of BCM95 curcumin is extremely safe, and it is very, very effective in general. And I'm talking about some of the cancers, notorious cancers such as pancreatic cancers and even glioblastomas. I have two patients who have been I've been talking to for some time, and they have seen tremendous benefits using this dose. 
Now, do you see a stopping of effect at a certain dose? Uh, has the dose response curve been taken up to where we're starting to see it flatten? Or uh, is this just based on this is the highest we've gone and we see it getting no, better and better? Yes, I mean, this, I do not encourage very high doses because I believe, based on some of the scientific data we have, that it's not always good that more is better. So, so I think that beyond certain dose, uh, probably it's not going to be because at some point you're going to saturate most of the receptors we have for curcumin. So I think I do not have a clear answer that what would be the stopping point, but in general people have been happy to consider doses such as five to 700 milligrams two or three times a day. And, and now, One other question. You talked about the role of methylation in yes. oncogene expression. Um, the flip side of that is that in CFS and fibromyalgia, we see a lot of people who have what are called methylation defects mm -hmm. that in other areas of biochemistry. Sure. Um, uh, we've not seen any issues of the curcumin affecting methylation and other uh, molecules besides the DNA structures. Do you have, you, do you have any thoughts for that? Uh, not really. I've not done much on that, but, but the two diff very different processes. The, 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 mention, uh, the, the topic I mentioned is about reversing DNA methylation changes, which are, which are much more subtle and they can be easily reversed. The, the concept I think you're talking about is about you know uh, amino acid uh, and uh, protein methylation and all that. I, I do not know of any adverse effects or negative effects of curcumin in that either. So, thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Um, you know, as, if I can chime in, I think that curcumin is safe at very high dosages. And I agree with Dr. Gold that there reaches a point where you've saturated all of the receptors in the body for which it's necessary. Um, I will say that the only adverse effects I've seen at very high dosing is the fact that curcumin is extremely healthy for the liver. And when you have a healthy liver, a healthy liver makes more bile. And more bile scoots the train out of the station faster. <laughs> so we see more, we don't see usually out and out diarrhea, but sometimes in very high dosing I've had individuals report um, more frequent, very soft stools. So, in fact, many integrative practitioners, if they're dealing with a particularly troubling um, or difficult illness or scenario, um, dose up to what they call bowel tolerance. And when their patients get to a point where they are experiencing maybe four or five soft stools a day and that's uncomfortable for them, then they back down to a little bit lower dose. But other than that, I have not seen any serious dose-related adverse effects using curcumin. And I'd also like to point out that with BCM95 curcumin, because each capsule is equal to up to 10 capsules of plain curcumin, every single time you increase the dose by one capsule, you're actually increasing the dose by as much as 10 capsules. So moving from two to three capsules a day is actually quite a large dose um, jump for most individuals. All right, let's see. I think that we've gotten through uh, most... Um, uh, any effects on curcumin and thyroid function? I've not seen any. Positive or negative. Dr. Gola, are you aware of anything on thyroid? Actually, no. Sorry, Cheryl. No, I wouldn't know That's okay. That. Uh, I would not be surprised if there isn't a study showing that some indirect uh, methodology, for example, especially thyroid cancer, it would be uh, because the same processes are involved, it would likely help to be preventative of and helping to prevent recurrences of thyroid cancer in any type of, um, like the autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's, I would, thyroiditis, I would think that because of curcumin's benefits in other autoimmune diseases, it might be useful for that as well. Um, but as far as like uh, reversing hypothyroidism, et cetera, et cetera, no, I don't believe that I have seen any types of studies on that specifically. Well, Michelle, Dr. Will, let me ask you, for autoimmune disease in general, uh, you have the inflammatory component, and for that, like an RA, we would expect to see benefits. Um, in terms of balancing immunity, though, well, beside, beyond just the inflammatory thing, have we have you seen data or had clinical experience with that helping? With uh, with autoimmunity? Yes. Yes. Well, in rheumatoid arthritis, yes, because some of the evaluations and people that are doing studies on uh, rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune disease are looking not just at pain and relief of swollen joints, but uh, changes in some of the blood parameters that are related to autoimmunity. 
Interesting, because then it might help the thyroid component because mm-hmm. the most common cause of low thyroid is autoimmune. It's Hashimoto's. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that would be uh, interesting. To look, I'll have to keep my eyes open with other autoimmune diseases clinically to see what we're seeing. Well, it's just so wait about 10 minutes. Together. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, just, just wait 10 or 15 minutes, and I'm sure five more studies on curcumin will be published. So. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. um, here, here is an excellent way to end our presentation today. If a person is normal and healthy, um, what, it, what would be a, just a good healthy dose to take every day just for prevention? Because, you know, as we mentioned before, of all the, all the causes of death, except for those that are um, self-inflicted, like car accidents, et cetera, <clears throat> it, it, chronic inflammation plays a crucial role. So how much should a healthy person take just for prevention? You want me to talk? So, sure, so whoever I'll, wants I'll, to jump in. Yes, and I'll let Dr. Teitelbaum say it to you. So I typically say a dose of anywhere between 250 to 500 milligrams once a day is probably a pretty uh, decent dose as a prophylactic preventative agent. And I've been using it. I know tons of people who have used it. Of course, there's no easy way of predicting or, or, or measuring how much somebody um, had prevented but the reason i say this dose is going back to the to the principles we we started talking about turmeric is part of typical south asian diets particularly in india and and i came up with these numbers based on a typical indian diet so when you look at a typical indian diet each meal people are consuming turmeric not curcumin and each meal typically includes about the amount of turmeric used in meal for each individual is about 100 milligrams for each meal. So if you're taking three meals, which is very typical, every Indian meal is yellow in color. It has a lot of turmeric. So I would think a typical Indian person takes about 300 milligrams, and that's why I think a range of somewhere between 250 to 500 milligrams probably is sufficient if you were to mimic those uh, daily consumptions in that diet. Would you agree with that, Dr. Teitelbaum? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I know I said that was a good question to end on, but I've had uh, two more come in that I think we can answer quite quickly. Uh, one has to do with Crohn's disease, and I know how debilitating that can be. It's been my experience when in reviewing the literature that a combination of curcumin and boswellia might be the best idea with regards to Crohn's disease because we're dealing with a lot of leukotriene moderated inflammation. Dr. Gold, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, we were just about to start another uh, trial on patients with Crohn's here at uh, in Dallas, not at Baylor, but uh, at our neighboring institution at the UT Southwestern. And I think there's, there, there's not much data on uh, Crohn's disease and curcumin, but we are very optimistic considering that curcumin is you know, such a potent anti-inflammatory, works with autoimmune diseases and all that. So I think this is one disease which has not been systematically studied, but we are very optimistic for all the reasons, yes. And also I would add that the Boswellia is especially, uh, it's my premier go-to herb uh, for people with uh, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's inflammatory bowel Mm -hmm. disease, as well as asthma. So I think taking a combination of the Boswellia and the BCM95 together would be a very good idea, as well as looking for food allergies, cut infections, other issues. And a healthy amount of... uh probiotics, I think, would be a nice addition to that. Uh, yes, very Absolutely. much so. Uh, it should be an enteric-coated one. And we seem to have a great deal of interest in curcumin and warfarin, coumadin. Um, mm-hmm. Three more questions have come in asking us to mention one more time about curcumin and warfarin. So if I can synopsize what we've said previously, coumadin is the brand name, warfarin is the generic, they're the same medication. It's a very strong blood thinner, and it has a very narrow range of activity. Almost everything interferes with warfarin levels in the body, including whether you eat a hamburger for lunch or a salad for lunch. It's that sensitive. And so extreme caution is utilized when you want to start to add something to a regimen. So we do encourage people to be cautious if they want to add BCM95 to their health regimen if they are on on Coumadin already or the generic warfarin by talking and working with their doctors. 
many individuals like Dr. Teitelbaum said previously that the way he does it is you're monitoring bleeding times anyway. He adds the curcumin, and then if there are no adverse effects on the blood studies associated with warfarin, uh, brand name Coumadin, then he continues with that. Um, if there is a negative impact, then of course you have to make the decision whether or not to continue with that. So I don't want I, we can't blanket say that it's always always easy to incorporate. We can't say blanket. Yes, it's completely safe. Please go do it. On the flip side, it would be difficult to say never at the same time. So that is probably of all the drugs that are on the market, the one that might offer the most challenges to incorporating BCM95 into a healthy regimen. Do you, either of you have anything to add? I would not hesitate to give it to my people who are on Coumadin, but that's only because I'm checking their bleeding time. So I would go ahead. Uh, your doctor needs to know uh, so they can check the blood test to make sure it's not changing the Coumadin level. For those of you on Coumadin who have very brittle bleeding times, so the tests are all over the place and difficult to control, ask your doctor about adding 100 micrograms of vitamin K. There's good data showing that those who have difficult to control bleeding times on a Coumadin, um, often you add the low dose. He's going to freak out and say, but that's going to block the Coumadin. No, not at that low dose. Look, have him look at the research. Um, but that will make it easier to add in the herbs that you need and keep a stable bleeding time on Coumadin. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I think we've gotten through... Just checking briefly to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Some of the questions that were similar I combined into one, so I apologize if you didn't get your individual question answered, folks. It looks like we've gotten through all of them. So thank you so much, Dr. Goal, and thank you so much, Dr. Teitelbaum. It's been a pleasure, as always, to uh, learn about the research that is currently underway with BCM95 curcumin. Uh, I would also like to mention that on August 15th, there's going to be a thyroid webinar called Jumpstart Your Thyroid that I'll be presenting. So if you're interested, you can register at terrytalksnutrition.com backslash webinars. For more information, uh, please feel free to contact us through the Terry Talks Nutrition website. There's an area about contact us or ask Terry a question. We'd be honored if you find us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. And... Um, again, Dr. Teitelbaum and Dr. Gold, we have uh, we've been extremely fortunate to have you able to join us today to talk about BCM95 and the research on this unique form of curcumin. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of our attendees. And until we all meet again, good health to you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.